birthday. Happy birthday, birthday, birthday to you. That's it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Josh. Did you know that yeah. recently the people who made that song, some of the television phone company, because they made a they made a film in which people sang Happy Birthday. The people, the family, the people who made the song sued for copyrights. What? Really? Well, that's all about the. <laughs> so, 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 so your parents want want you to be a bud in. Uh, uh, what's it? Um, apologist or polemicist? I, I'm, I really don't like the terms polemicist or apologist. Do you so, know why? why? It's just applied by anyone yeah. to people who are defending their own views. Yeah. So it's you. Just, it, 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 it has this negative connotation. Speaker's corner, it's Rabbi Tovia Tov, Tov, Singer. Like, I wouldn't consider you an apologist, even yeah. though you're defending Christianity. Yeah. Because you're just defending Christianity, yeah. right? That's, you shouldn't be called an apologist for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think an apologist has to be someone who's defending his own actions. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Pangs of guilt. Uh, he feels a little bit, deep down he feels he's doing something wrong, therefore he comes up with a defence. That's being an apologist. Well, I mean, people just apology. say... Apology? What's an apology? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the kind of the beginning of the word, but um, I guess that's just what. Also, NASA launched a ship called Apollo G. Really? Okay. Apollo G. <laughs> uh, Interesting. So, I yeah. Promise humor. Uh, so you two can be, you know, the you could call it Todavia in the in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? What? Rabbi Tovia Singer. Oh, Tovia Singer. Tovia oh. Singer. You, you like the well, speaker's it's, corner. It's, it's already got a channel. We've, we've got a channel no, now. Yeah, I know. Jews in the corner. I saw it. Yeah. You sent it Jews to me. Jews at the corner. So you're going to be like here regularly every week? That's kind the of, plan, um, although it seems like we're being shut down next week. Yeah, unfortunately. How long are you going to be around for? At least for? this time. We've got a deadline. Well, I've finished Yeshiva, so... Well, they, but they might re extend it. That's the whole problem. Is they always say that. So it doesn't. The last time there was a lockdown, we knew it was just indefinite. Well, that's the, the thing is, I feel like they don't want to get people in uproar, so they'll say it's going to be a month, and then they will start extending it. Yeah, obviously they're going to do that. They did it the they're, first time. Exactly. No, last time they didn't give us the time. No, they said it would be nine weeks. I don't remember any deadline. Are you? Are you gonna? How, how long are you in the UK then? I, I'm in here for until until the Messiah comes. To see oh really? Yeah. <laughs> when, 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 you know when the first when the first lockdown began? <laughs> until the Messiah said, comes. When, when COVID began, people said that COVID will not last long. Yeah. It was made in China. Well, now uh, we know. <laughs> Now that's ex well, yeah. I heard that joke. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you need to be quick with that vomit. You need to be quick with that vomit. That's it. It's the Jewish uh, sense of humour. That's why there's so many entertainers who are Jewish. It's uh, the wit. You know, a man goes on a date. He has to keep social distancing. So I said, "How did it go?" He says, "Oh yes, it was nice to meet her." I didn't get that. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> a, a, a guy goes on a date. Yeah. But he has to keep social distancing. Yeah. I said to him, "How did it go?" And he said, "Yes, it was nice to meet her." Nice, nice to meet her. Meet her. To meet her. To meet her. To meet her. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 there, there's loads and loads of these jokes. There's a whole pandemic. Pandemic. <laughs> I have a feeling I've been turning this the wrong way. No, but it's not in the hole. You're not even it's putting not it in the hole. No, it is in the hole. No, look, you have to put oh, the screw bit. Ah, oh. oh, you see? Well, it's new. <laughs> I, 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 I've I, just looked at it and I've already figured it out in like see, two you're, seconds. You're, you're, you're afraid of these kind of things. <laughs> if, if only you could be like this with the Tanakh. Well, it <laughs> seems like you are like this with your uh, Talmud <laughs> and the Tanakh. Oh, I've got your stuff on that. Don't you worry. All right. I mean, you should be worried. Okay, on the roof rabbi and stuff like that. Talk. Okay, Ooh. have you got an answer for the roof rabbi and stuff? I okay. Josh, do, do, do you want to record this? Um, download this. From ah, nothing like the great outdoors. Uh, Look, all the, like the have you been pilfering hatuns? Have you been posing as hatun to get the flowers? Okay, fine. What's yeah. that? If he's alright with that. Yeah. I would like him to be in the combo as well. Okay. Why do I need to be... To get your opinion. Two birds with one stone. I'm like this here, it's a joke. 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 Well, I think here's okay, because they're... Like, the pier's still open, isn't it? So... Because that's the cap for the way the mic is going to go. 
Let's have a to get this on. Maybe paper boy, maybe you know how this will go on the front. It's to do with glare, although I don't know if there's going to be any glare. Yeah, well, I I, yeah, I, I don't think you need this. Not now, anyway. All right, then in that case, we're not going to bother with this. Yeah. What's this piece? Yeah, well, this is uh, is the thing that for where oh, the microphone, microphone goes. as well. Yeah. So, uh, have your family seen your videos then? Oh yeah. Okay. Nice. Who is this paper boy? Ah, look who is. I'm standing up with you, this is my bro. I have your story, man. I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get you with the story. Yeah. No, 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 I don't. Thank you. What, what, what kind of rubbish security is this? You come after everyone's gone. You two, uh, I said you, I said you two were supposed to be like here, like at the beginning. You just come like. Ah, uh, look, you put in the church card, don't you? No, I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't. See that. I was like over there. They were over there. Yeah. Oh no no. It's rolling now, by the way. So whenever you guys are ready. Oh, let him just. Uh... Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, you don't know. 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 Ah, you see, didn't tighten Josh. Ah, you see, that's like you're handling of the Tanakh. Ah, yeah. Alright, guys. Okay, rolling now. So. Okay, so today we're gonna continue our discussion that I left off with Josh last week. So. To recap, if, if people didn't watch the video we did last week, I started off with looking at Islam. And the purpose of bringing up Islam was to look at the claims that Islam makes and whether it's, a, whether it's truth claims. So we looked at some of the passages and some of the hadiths to see if there was a, any Jewish recollection of some of the stories about it. And Josh confirmed that there, there was no Jewish text within Judaism that affirmed these stories and the reason I brought this up was not for point scoring but just to establish how do we get to truth truth has to be based on things that we can establish as fact so it would seem strange if a book makes claims about certain people and those people don't remember any of the stories about it so then I use a comparison with Christianity that the claims that Christians make can be taken from the Tanakh and can even be associated with some of the claims made by rabbis. Now, with Josh, he brought up some of the opinions from rabbis. And what we find is that when we look at the Tanakh in plain reading, it's very clear as to what it says. Then Josh will go to the interpretation of the rabbis and say it can be very difficult to understand the Midrash and the Talmud and so forth. But if this, we have an oral law from God, and this oral law is an explanation of the Tanakh. It seems very strange that it's very difficult to understand the explanation of the Tanakh. Now, there's even a saying Wait, as... Of the Tanakh or the Talmud? Of the, the, the oral law is the explanation yes. of, the, of the Tanakh. Yes. So, in going with this, even as um, my friend here was saying some of his jokes, there's a saying, how many Jews does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is 30. One to change the light bulb and 29 to discuss and give 29 contradictory ways to change the light bulb. And this is exactly how one understands the, 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 oral, the, oral, the oral law. Because when we've looked at some of the statements by these uh, rabbis, they seem to contradict themselves. And as we go through this discussion again... Not themselves, each other. Each other. So if they are explaining what the Tanakh says, why would they then be contradicting each other? Josh gave the answer in a previous discussion that all answers must be true in a metaphysical way. But even if their statements appear contradictory. So what we're going to do, we're going to continue 
where we left off. Sometimes you can get two things. Yes. Which might appear to be contradictions. Okay. But then you hear a whole explanation as to how they don't contradict each other at all. Okay. And I'll, I'll pass it just to if you want to give your like opening statements and then we can continue where we left Amazon off last week. All right. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, here with Paperboy again, as he just said. Mm. And uh, he brought up various rabbinical texts last week in an effort to try to. Oh, very nice. In an effort to try and uh, and prove that the rabbis think that Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, which of course we know is not the case. And he brought up at the end of last time a medrash from Ruth Rabba, Ruth Rabba, and uh, and in Ruth Rabba, it he found it quotes Isaiah 53, and he said, "Look, it's using it as a proof for something about the Messiah having suffering, right?" So now what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to have a look, analyze this medrash, and see if it really proves what Paperboy thinks it does that the rabbis in the old texts used to say that this chapter was about the Messiah. And we're going to see that this does not actually prove what Paperboy thinks it does at all. Okay, so, and also, when we go on from that, I will bring up other verses that Christians use to establish the understanding that Christ would have been the Messiah. Because if I ask you, how do, you, how do people come to the conclusion that a verse is messianic? How do people? Well, it depends which people. The rabbis. The rabbis. Yeah. The rabbis come to the conclusion about which verse is messianic. If it's talking about something that will happen in the end of days, if it's talking about something that will happen at the redemption, these kind of things. Okay, so now, if that is the criteria, and what we'll go through is looking at why other rabbis understood certain verses that you now reject as messianic. Because that's why I'm asking, what is the criteria? Because as we go with Isaiah, as we start with Isaiah 53, you brought up Jonathan Ben Uzel, yes. who was um, a very renowned rabbi. Yes. Now, he understood this verse as messianic. And this is why I asked you that question. What is the criteria for someone to, t to determine whether a verse is messianic or not? Well, it depends. Are you talking about messianic in the simple sense of the verse in context? Or you're talking about whether or not they consider it ver uh, whether they, c they can use it in an, in, a, in an exegetical way, in a drush kind of way, to, and I've explained drush in previous videos, um, to illustrate a point. So we know that Jonathan ben Uziel, he, it, his commentary, his Tarragum, is really an exegetical um, type of commentary. It's not a literal translation of the text by any means. And therefore, when, he, when Jonathan ben Uziel looks at various chapters and sees that sometimes it says, my servant Israel, and sometimes it doesn't, he will take the place that it, do it doesn't as an inference that this will not be Israel, and therefore he'll say that those are Messiah. But what's interesting about Jonathan ben Uziel on Isaiah 53 is that he switches from the servant being, being, uh, being the Messiah straight away in verse, to, to, verse, to 52, 14 to talking about that the sufferer is the house of Israel. And he continues through the end of the chapter that sometimes it seems like the servant is the nation. Sometimes it seems to him that the servant is the people of Israel and sometimes it seems it's the Messiah. But never in Jonathan and Israel do we see a Messiah suffering for sins, and never in any rabbinical commentary have we ever seen anything about the Messiah dying for sins. Okay, so if we look at his um, translation again, I'll start from verse 5. Of course. And it says, Therefore he shall pray for our sins. Wait, and our get, it, why are you starting from verse 5? You should start from 52.13. You don't well, want to do that. No, because you made the statement about that point, so I just want to get to the crux ah, of okay. the points where it refers to dying for the sins or the, okay. the chastisements for, for sins rather than starting again from the beginning because I just want to focus on that part and oh, what it says. So it says, therefore he shall pray for our sins and our iniquities his sake shall be forgiven us for we are considered crushed, smitten of the Lord and afflicted. He shall build the house of the sanctuary which has been profaned on the account of our sins. He was delivered over on the account of our iniquities and through his doctrine peace shall be multiplied upon us and through the teaching of his words our sin shall be forgiven us all like all we like sheep have been scattered every one of us has turned to his own way it pleased the lord to forgive the sins of us for his sake he shall pray and shall be answered yea therefore he shall open his mouth he shall be heard he shall deliver over the mighty of the nations and the lamb to the slaughter and like a
Twelve. <laughs> bit lost. Ah. Eight. eight. I don't have the title of it. <laughs> I love how you're using that book. There was as me, opposed to, oh yeah, as, the, 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 sorry, sorry. The, there was me thinking last week you had unique arguments. Turns out these all came from Driver's book, Driver and Neuberger's book in the 18, 1870s. I've never read that book, but I'll continue. This is the book you're holding right now. Oh, with the, um, yes. oh, the translation. Yeah. Not the argument. Anyway, we'll continue. And like a sheep before his shearers is dumb, none shall in his presence open his mouth or speak a word. Actually, it's before in verse four and five where it speaks about the... Oh dear, you really have confused yourself this time. Okay, now let me continue from nine, sorry. Oh, okay. He shall gather our captives from affliction and pain, and who shall be able to narrate the wonderful works which shall be done for us in his days? He shall remove the rule of the nations from the land of Israel, the sins which my people have commanded and have come upon them. And he shall deliver the wicked into hell and the riches of the treasures, and they got by violence into death of Abaddon that they who commit sin shall not remain, that they should not speak of folly with their mouth. And it was the pleasure of the Lord to refine and purify the remnant, remnant of his people in order to clean their souls from sin, that they might see the kingdom of the Messiah, that their sons and daughters might keep, might multiply and prolong the days and those who kept the law of the Lord shall prosper through his pleasure. So, so. here we see that this person is taking praying for the sins and taking the iniquities and that for his sake the nation shall be forgiven but we also see because it, it talks about one who's righteous and we also know in Isaiah he condemns Israel as being sinful so therefore if Israel is sinful it cannot be the one who is without sin well where does it say he's without sin? His, for his, his righteousness Righteousness does not mean without sin. So, as it says in Ecclesiastes, sorry, yeah. there is no righteous man on right. earth who does good and does not sin. Right. So, so, so Israel was not con considered righteous because Isaiah even con uh, condemned the nation as a whole because they were blaspheming the Lord because they were, they were worshiping idols. Exactly. So the nation cannot be the one who was righteous to redeem itself. It had to be someone else who was defined, and this is why. Even within the nation, there's always different factors. But that's why, I'm, that's why I said this cannot be the nation of Israel because it's speaking, well, he's saying it's speaking as the nation as a whole. Within why the nation of Israel, you get some people who are exactly. on the path. A remnant, right. So that would be the Messiah, the, right, the, the no, righteous one. All the people are on the path. But Isaiah condemned the nation as being unrighteous. Because the nation has in its exactly. elements and Exactly. So the nation cannot be righteous to read in himself because they were condemned as unrighteous by Isaiah himself because you've got frag different factions within the nation so then it cannot be the nation itself that's the point if it you're trying to say it's a remnant within the nation the, but then, the righteous remnant of the nation this is what m most rabbinical matries have said but then you've said that Isaiah 53 is talking about the nation not yes, a remnant yeah, look what we're talking about is, yes. we're talking about the servant of God, yes. okay? Now obviously somebody who doesn't serve God is not going to be called the servant of God. Nobody thinks that. There's no rabbi who's ever said such a thing. That it, it even includes the wicked of Israel. Nobody thinks that. Obviously it's talking about the righteous of Israel when it says, the, uh, my servant, right? And in fact, if you look every single place where verses in Isaiah 53 are quoted, they're quoted to talk about righteous people. So whether or not it's quoted to talk about Rabbi Akiva, as it is in the Yerushalmi, in uh, in Masechet um, Shkolim 21a, or whether or not it's taken to to be used about Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses our teacher, mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in 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 various midrashim, or whether or not it's taken to talk about the Messiah in Ruth Rabba, or and in indeed the Targum, or in right, or whether or not it's talking about anyone who who has been given troubles by God, Yisurin. Right, like it does in Tractate Brochus 5a, right? Or, okay, there's so many different things. It, 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 there's one medrash in, in the Sifrei in Bamidbar Rabbo, repeated in it, sorry, Sifrei Bamidbar, and it's repeated in Sifrei Devarim, um, where, where, it, where it quoted as referring to Pinchas Ben Elazar, Phineas, the son of Elazar, the, the priest, right, grandson of Aaron. So we see what, what's the rabbis, what are they saying? They're saying that this passage refers to the righteous of Israel. 
and we can apply this to individual righteous people within Israel and that's what we see throughout rabbinic teaching. So it's gone for, from the nation as a whole to a remnant? Well we, when I said a nation as a whole I, I, never int I never thought that anyone would actually think that I was referring to the wicked ones as well. When we talk about Jews we should not be talking about those who do not believe in Judaism and who do not practice Judaism. That would be like saying that a Christian um, can be somebody who does not believe Jesus to be the Messiah or a Muslim can be somebody who does not believe Muhammad to be a prophet. That is obviously absurd. So there are two points to add to that. So then obviously we went to the Ruth Rabbi where it says the Messiah and he will eat the world to come. The fifth explanation for come here is King Messiah. Come here. This is draw near to kingship and eat from the bread and this is the bread of kingship and deep your morsel in the vinegar this is his chastisement as it is said but he was wounded for our transgression now, now adding this to also again why would Jonathan Ben Uzel who is one of the most influential rabbis be confused into thinking that or describing it as a singular person and then attributing the verse to the Messiah as well verse 12 so what you're asking is a good question and I'm going to answer your question but in order to do that we need to we need to do a little bit of an exercise here mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about various verses in the Tanakh and ask you what you think the simple meaning of their verses are okay so first of all Zechariah I'd like you to turn to Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2 and I'd like you to tell me what you think the verse is talking about and then we'll see how the Medjush uses it okay Zechariah Zechariah chapter 14 verse 2 it might be slightly different in the Christian version. I know that 14, the Jewish version will have it different. What For I will there? gather the nations yeah, against the Jerusalem to battle and city shall be taken and the house is plundered and the women raped. Half of the... So... Now, what do you think that verse is talking about? Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the... This is talking about... Sorry. Behold, the day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. So wasn't this talking about the exile? Uh, no, this was... A f well, we see, we would say there's two different verses, um, yeah. two, two different understandings, but I won't go into the second Christian interpretation. Are any of the interpretations that you would believe are the simple understanding of these verses here talking about kingship being taken away from the Messiah do you see that anywhere in these verses no no well lo and behold the Medrash mm -hmm. straight after the part that you quoted yeah says kingship will be taken away from him the Messiah for a while as it is stated and then quotes chapter 14 verse 2 of Zechariah so now, within uh, the mid hold on, hold okay. on. then the Medrash does something else well, could you please turn to something we can both agree is a messianic prophecy okay. Isaiah chapter 11 so Isaiah chapter 11 we all agree Christians and Jews all agree that this is a messianic prophecy right. there shall come forth right. a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his root shall bear fruit yes and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him yes and the spirit of wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord yes continue continue he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked okay now stop there now that last verse verse 4 what do you think that's talking about verse 4 yes verse 4 that you just read but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek from the earth and he shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth so this is obviously talking about judgment, yes. that the, now, the, the Messiah... Now, do you see any evidence from the words and he shall strike the land with the rod of his mouth, anything to do with kingship being restored to the Messiah? From verse 4? Yeah, from verse 4. Do you well, see any... It, it, doesn't, it talks about him judging, yeah, so, so then we would have to... Nothing to do with kingship, right? Nothing to do with kingship being returned to the Messiah. Nothing yes. to do with that. But right? even... Now, before... the Medrash, in the next line, after the quotes from Zechariah, mm -hmm. then says, kingship was res kingship was res kingship was restored to him the messiah okay as, as it says and then it quotes the words from chapter 11 verse 4 in isaiah and he shall strike the la strike the land with the rod of his mouth mm -hmm. now but this all shows us something very important and this is something that i wanted to talk to you about today medrash also known as agoda 
is not something which takes verses literally, does not take verses in context. Medrash, Agada, is a form of storytelling that explores ethics and values in biblical texts. In fact, the word Agada means story or telling in Hebrew. Yeah, go right? on. You, did, you didn't see this one coming, did you? Go on. Medrash is not something which quotes verses in context. It only ever quotes verses out of context. That's what Medrash does. Medrash is not proving chastisement of the Messiah from Isaiah, from Isaiah 53, 5, nor is it proving kingship being taken away from the Messiah in Zechariah 14, 2, nor is it proving um, that the kingship will return to the Messiah from Isaiah 11, 4. And in fact, if you were to read from the beginning of this particular Medrash all the way to the end, not, and it quotes over 20 verses, not a single one of them is in context. And the entire Medrash is based on a verse in Ruth, which has nothing to do with the Messiah. It's a verse in Ruth, where, in, it, in chapter 2, verse 6, I believe, where it says, And Boaz said to her, to Ruth, Come near to here, take of the bread, and, and, uh, d and it, d dip it in vinegar. And she sat by the har on the side of the harvesters, she ate, she was satisfied, and there was some left over. Right? And, and it, Rabbi Yochanan, or some versions say Rabbi Yonason, used this verse in six different ways. One talking about King David, one talking about King Solomon, one talking about ki ki King Hezekiah, one talking about King Menashe, one talking about the King Messiah, and the sixth one finally giving the simple understanding, which is about Boaz himself. Right? Clearly, this Medrash is not taking the verses literally, and to try to use it as a proof that the rabbis actually thought Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah is completely, is completely absurd, because no rabbis ever thought that, I, that Zechariah 14 is about the Messiah. No, no, no rabbis ever thought that, that, I, that Isaiah 11.4 is about kingship being restored to the Messiah. Clearly, these verses are being used in exegetical ways, out of context, to illustrate points, like Medrash always does. Finish? Yes. Okay. Alright, so I'll, I'll keep going. Two of those. Yeah. <laughs> so, basically, let's just even look at uh, Isaiah 11 yeah. and highlight why the Jewish perspective is very problematic. Because. Wait, are you going to address what I just said? Yeah, I'm going to address one by one. But oh, okay. even with the understanding of the verse, I'll go on to that. It says, the first verse says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, yes. and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. Indeed. Now this is the problem that Jewish people have. The verse is very clear that says that the Messiah will come from the line of David. Now most Jews today do not know their lineage. So when they pick out verses that say, well this is what the Messiah will do when he comes. One of the criteria within the Tanakh is that he has to come from the line of David. Hold on, can I ask you something? Yes. If he has to come from the line of David, how can he be the son of God? That is a totally irrelevant and different question. But clearly, it, here it says, there shall come forth a, sh for well, a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and the branch is also known so as the Messiah. The Messiah is clearly a, a regular human lineage. Which a Christ was, because Christ was born of Mary. Right, so therefore well, he had a human goes body. By men. Goes by the fathers, not by the mothers. Anyway, but regardless. Regardless. So now, what we, um, Josh has said is that when you go into the um, the midrash, that scholars, the rabbis, use different verses to then interpret different things. Within, so they may not take it literally. They're illustrating points. Right. So now, the point is, as I started with my joke, was that. There are so many different con con um, different understandings of certain verses. So the question again would be, he brought up Isaiah 53. The reason, we then have to ask, why would he bring up Isaiah 53 if it was the nation of Israel? Yes. Because he's using it as an illustration for a different verse. Yes. So the question would be, why is he using it as an illustration? Yes, the question does, does indeed exist. But no, but there's no reason to say that he actually thinks that empathy is about that. Okay. Now, 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 we could ask that on the other rabbinical texts that mention Isaiah 53 that I mentioned before, right? So, for example, the Yerushalmi that I mentioned earlier in Masechet Shkolim 21a. Masechet Shkolim 21a says that, says that, the, that, that 
the, uh, quotes uh, Isaiah 53 verse 12 and applies it and says this is talking about Rabbi Akiva. Now obviously no rabbis actually think that Isaiah 53 12 is talking about Rabbi Akiva. Nobody thinks that, right? What's it doing? What's this verse doing? It, well, what's, sorry, what's this Yerushalmi doing? He is, he, he is very clearly um, using this verse to show you that to, to, to show you the greatness of Rabbi, of Rabbi Akiva, he's describing the greatness or illustrating the greatness of Rabbi Akiva by using a verse in Isaiah 53, even though he knows perfectly well Isaiah 53 is not about Rabbi Akiva. And so too in the other places I mentioned, the place that talked about uh, um, using this to refer to Moshe, even though it's clearly not talking about Moshe, the, the place that talks of, in Sifre where it quotes it and talks about. Um, Pinchas, Phineas, the son of Elazar, when it's clearly not talking about him, right? These are clearly meant not taking it literally. These are not actual interpretations of Isaiah 53. And the one common link that they all have is that they talk about righteous Jews. They're all talking about righteous Jews. Rabbi, whether it was Moshe, who was the father of the prophets, who, who in, a, in, a, in an esoteric sense saw God face to face, Right, the only the only person to ever do such a thing, um, or, or whether or, or whether it is they're, they're comparing it to Pinchas ben Elazar, Phineas the son of Elazar, who 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 God said, I, I give him my covenant of peace. Right, this is the kind of person we're dealing with, or whether it was Rabbi Akiva, who is considered one of the greatest Tanaic rabbis. Right. <laughs> or whether the, it's going to be the Messiah who's going to be this amazing righteous, righteous Jew who's going to, who's going to bring the world to its perfection. Okay, right? so this, is, this is a very clear common link and it all fits into what I've said all along that it talks about the Jewish people and not wicked Jews, obviously, actual faithful religious Jews who are servants of God. Okay, so let me just interject there. So the, the reason why I'm going through these, some of these verses is because I want the audience to understand that within the Old Testament, you have verses that talk about the Messiah. Now, the Christian perspective is these verses, if you accept them, even the verses where some of the rabbis have said they were about the Messiah, if you accept them, they will all point towards Jesus being the Messiah. Because uh, Jews reject some of these verses like Isaiah 53, even though we have rabbis saying that they were about the Messiah, if you reject them, then they will not lead you to Christ, to Jesus as being the Messiah. And then you will take the Jewish position as you will continually be waiting for the Messiah. Now, this is the difference. Jesus tells us that the Pharisees followed the tradition of men and they rejected him. So what we are looking at, if we look at it historically, is that there were verses that even rabbis have confirmed or stated that they were about the Messiah, as for example, Jonathan Ben Uzel stated that put the Messiah in Isaiah 53. There's no rabbinical Jew. There's no rabbinical Jew now who will say there's, this is anything to do with the Messiah. But obviously, if you accepted this verse was about the Messiah, then you would understand it was a prophecy about Christ. And this is why I'm going to go to um, your favorite now, Isaiah 7:14. Hold on, before you get to Isaiah 7:14, let me just respond to what you've just said. Yes. Um, because what you've just said is, well, utter nonsense. Because how could you possibly get Jesus being fulfilled in Isaiah 53? No, n n nowhere in Isaiah 53 do we talk about somebody dying. Nowhere in Isaiah 53 do we talk about somebody dying in the land of living, which is the land of living being the land of Israel, from, as we know from other verses where the land of Israel is called the land of living, right? The Eretz Chaim, the land of living. Jesus died in Israel. He was crucified and there is no reference to anyone dying for other people or dying for themselves even in Isaiah 53 and uh, no, no reference to somebody in the land of Israel at all. Clearly it cannot be Jesus. And may I point out that Isaiah, 52, Isaiah 53 talks about this, uh, Isaiah 52 rather, 15, talks about the astonishment of the nations at the success of this servant of God. The only people who are going to be astonished if Jesus turns out to be the Messiah are the Jews. Right? The nations are not going to be surprised in the slightest. The Christians certainly won't. The Muslims certainly won't. Well, Although, of course, the Christians and Muslims have different definitions but, but of the Messiah. That's not an argument because when Christ does return, the Jews will be stunned. So, but it's talking about the nations, the kings of nations. That's what it says. 
in 52, 14 and 15. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking, it's not talking about the Jewish people there. It says the kings of the nations, okay? That clearly is not the nation of Israel. Never, we do we, never do we find the plural referring to a singular. Whereas, although we find all, all the way across the Tanakh, the singular referring to a collective whole, the plural. Okay, so let's go Which of on. course is your whole Trinitarian and, argument. Uh, because I want to develop this argument about the suffering Messiah. But if we... What's happening? Oh. Oh. Hello. This is the times we live in, a police state. Okay, so... Oh, yes. Because what I want to do is go through some of the verses that Christians appeal to to establish that these were messianic verses and because the Jews don't accept them that they are now waiting for the Messiah but these are things that predicted Christ who was the Messiah who was the fulfillment of these passages so Isaiah 14 7 14, 7, 14. says Ah yes, the misquote of Matthew one twenty three. So it says And I'm sure most most people know this verse and it's quoted in Matthew. It of says you've never read verse. Therefore 13, have you? the Lord himself will give give you a sign. Behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Well that's a mistranslation. It does not say virgin and it does not say will conceive it says young woman and it says has conceived okay this is a mistranslation and don't try to back it up with septuagint because we all know that it uses the same word to refer to dina after she was raped and that does not mean virgin obviously so so what he's talking about is that the verse talks about someone who was who was an alma now yes. the question is what is an alma so if i said to someone an adolescent child who here would think that an adolescent child is not a virgin because we have to understand, especially within ancient cultures. That hey, Blair, good thanks. Oh, good? Yep. Yeah. No, so let me explain something to you at this moment in time. Unfortunately, you're in a group larger than six, <laughs> so you're breaching uh, can we... the station. Right. I'm, I'm going right, to have to ask you to spread out. Can we just spread out a little bit? Yeah, can we just spread out? Let's split up into a different, in separate groups, smaller groups. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can like congregate there and another over there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to disprove what Josh has said because let's start with what an understanding of an alma is because in the cultural context we know within is Israelite or even ancient antiquity that. Most women was, were deemed as defiled if they had been with another man. So it's commonly traditional that a woman who was of a, a, a young maiden would generally be of a virgin. Now, if you can go they to married very young, if Genesis. you can go to um, Genesis, Genesis. twenty twenties, yes, correct. In Parshas Chayes, Sora, you're going to bring Rebecca. Yes, of course you are. So can we go to that fourteen? Sure. It's not going to prove what you think it's going to okay. prove. Because you will have to deal with why Isaiah 7 does not yeah. say the word basula when what it really That's right. fine. Right? You're going to have so, to deal with Because there's two words for virgins. Oh, so a word, word, for, a word virgin. for virgin, basula. Now let's go to, what's it? All right. Genesis chapter 24. 14. 14. this. says, it says, and uh, the girl to whom I shall say, let down my pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink, and she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Yeah. Let her be that thou hast appointed for, my, for thy servant Yitzchok, and thereby shall I know that he has done speaking. Okay, no, what was the, next bit. What the, was the verse used in 14? Na'aro. Na'aro. Okay, now continue to 15. Okay. That's verse 15. 16. Verse 16. Okay, so 
So here it calls her a virgin. Okay, Correct. continue. And then it says, Vayot forever, they call soch, Vayom agmini no matmai mekadech, this doesn't help you. But don't worry, don't worry, people can look in the English, Soka will always put it up, and my viewers will probably know what this is. You, you really want me to be reading from verse, uh, let's have a look, you really want me to skip now to where we actually call her an Alma later on, which is 43. all the way in verse 43. 43, there we are. So verse 43 says, okay. Okay. All right. And here he calls her an Alma. So Thank you have her called so, by all three things. So, so she was A, an Alma, B, a Basola, and three, an, a, 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 B, a C, an Alma. So, so my, my point was this, that he, Josh has just confirmed. I said to you, if someone is an ad adolescent, would we expect them to not be a virgin? Most in society would know an adolescent person would generally be a virgin. Some cultures, they wouldn't be. But I've gone to this verse in Genesis, which attributes three different words three to different words exactly but she was a virgin it confirms it uses the yeah. word Bethlehem. so it's using alma in conjunction with Bethlehem. so therefore she was a young maiden but my point was this if someone is a young maiden they would generally be presumed to be a virgin so yes they are different words but because of the cultural context we know that Yes, a young, someone can be a young maiden, but generally, because people did not like sleep around or anything, you would be of young marrying an age, that generally you would be a virgin. That's why it uses three different qualifiers for this same person. Now, my question would be to you, can you give me a verse where it uses Alma to de clearly demonstrate someone who is not a virgin? Yes, Proverbs Apart chapter 30. Okay, let's go there. I'm sure you've heard this before. Okay. Of course. Let's go to Proverbs yeah, chapter 30. Quick, quick battery check. So All right. Look at our boats. Uh, 